And uh, now, uh, today, we start with the first in a new series of Mon Monday features. This new series is called A Tale of Two Sisters. Now, today, Joan York is sitting in the other corner of the studio, and uh, she is with two sisters sitting opposite her, and they are waiting to tell her their story. The story of two sisters. And the two sisters are Louise and Ida Cook whose adventures you may have read about in the book, We Followed Our Stars. Their passion in life is opera, and this passion has led them into some rather unexpected situations. Most of the sisters we're going to bring you in this series will have had contrasting lives, but the Cook sisters have hardly ever been separated, and they go together to operatic performances, not only in London, but all over the world. Will you start, Ida, by telling me how it all began? Well, it was really Louise who first started it all. Yes, Ida was away from London, being a bridesmaid, and I happened to see the posters for Madame Butterfly up outside Covent Garden. I thought, I've never seen an opera, now's the time. So I wandered in and started a lifelong servitude. So when I came back, I found her in the most peculiar condition. She insisted that I too must share her discovery, and she dragged me off to my first opera. Rigoletto, if I remember rightly. Yes, it was. Then during the same year, our favourite gramophone artist, Gally Kurchi, visited England on a concert tour. We heard her and were so fascinated that we decided we simply must hear her in opera. The awkward thing was, we found she sang opera only in New York. So to New York we had to go. Well, it's not so easy going to New York just like that. How did you manage it? Well, fortunately we'd always been brought up to understand that if we wanted anything, it was up to us to get it ourselves, or else quite simply go without. So it was just a question of saving up the money. It wasn't too easy, because we were both earning only between two and three pounds a week. We made a firm resolve to put aside a pound a week each, and make do on the rest. pound a week out of two or three pounds? Wasn't that very <laughs> difficult going? Oh yes, it was. But first of all, we cheered ourselves up by writing to Gally Kurchi, who was still in London, and telling her what we intended to do. She replied by return of post, saying that if ever we succeeded in getting to New York, she would give us tickets for everything she sang. And you did succeed. Yes, we did, but it took all the resolution we had. We seldom had a proper lunch, learned that a brown roll fills you better than a white one, that sort of thing, and we never took a bus if we could walk. Tell me, what did your family think about all this? How did they react? Well, as a matter of fact, we didn't tell our parents for the first year, because even we thought it sounded a bit mad to say we were going to New York when we had no money. But when we finally told them, though they were rather horrified, they considered that we'd earned the money ourselves and saved it and were entitled to spend it as we liked. I'm sure they worried, of course, but they always held the view that having brought us up to what they considered the correct standards of behaviour, they must let us buy our own experience for ourselves. And what do you think of New York when you finally got there? Oh, well, neither of us ever forget our first impression of the New World. When we saw the skyline of Manhattan as we came into New York Harbour, we just fell in love with the place for life. And when we were actually in New York, we simply walked straight up Fifth Avenue, didn't we? Yes, we didn't dare get on a bus because we didn't know what it was going to cost us. We still had to count every penny, of course. Incidentally, we'd made all our clothes for the trip. I didn't make any, I just wore them. Yes, that was the awful part of it. I don't know whether you know, Louise, to this day, but I cut the pattern of your evening dress the wrong way round so that the bow was on the wrong <laughs> hip. <laughs> you felt quite at ease, did you, in your homemade clothes? Oh, rather. I remember feeling marvellous as we sat in the stores at the Metropolitan. We thought we were just as well dressed as anybody else. But that was partly because Gally Kirchy was so kind to us that we never felt awkward. Well, that was how it all began, I suppose, and that first trip to New York really started you on your operatic wandering. Yes, it did. And it started me on my writing career, too. Because as soon as we got back to England, I wrote an article on how we made all our clothes to go and see Gally Kirchy. Then other articles followed, and presently I was offered a job on, on the paper for which I'd written. And what were you doing meanwhile, Louise? Well, I was still at the office. But every season at Covent Garden, we were in the gallery practically every night. It was in the gallery queue that I started my famous collection of snapshots of the opera stars. And I began it with a picture of Rosa Poncel, who was the greatest figure of the Italian season in the early 30s. And as a matter of fact, it was really our snap collection which started us on our refugee work. Now that's in, in some ways the most exciting part of your story, the refugee work. Will you tell us about it? Well, it really began in 1934, with the visit of the famous Viennese conductor Clemens Krauss and his wife, the singer Viorico Zuliak. I had photographed them, and that led to one of our operatic friendships. We followed them to Salzburg, where they introduced us to the official lecturer of the festival, a Jewish lady from Frankfurt am Main. 
We didn't even know she was Jewish at the time, or what the significance of that was in Europe in those days. We only knew she was charming and that they'd asked us to look after her when she came to England. When she did come and gradually told us her story, we began to see for the first time, in terms of an ordinary middle class family like ourselves, just what was happening in the centre of Europe. And from that, you began to build up quite a system, didn't you, for helping Jewish refugees to get out of Germany? Yes, Ida by now was a successful fiction writer and was able to finance the work, you see. Mm -hmm. Yes, we had money for the first time in our lives. That's the most dramatic thing in the whole story, because it practically never happens like that. Either you see a great need, but you have no money, or you have the money and you don't see the need. And just at the very moment when we needed it, the money started coming in. Sometimes £25 well spent could save a man's life. Then Louise learned German as her part of the work. Oh, why was that necessary? I mean, what did the work actually involve? Well, from the time the crisis started us on the work until ten days before war broke out, we used to go to Germany or Austria every two or three months. And each time we'd interview about 15 people. I soon realised that one of us must have a working knowledge of German, if only to explain the complicated regulations. And so I set to work to learn it. And did the Nazi authorities realise what you were doing? Well, they started getting suspicious at Cologne Aerodrome because we came so often and for such short periods. And then Clemens Krauss, who kept up a personal interest in what we were doing, hit on a marvellous idea. He was head of the Munich Opera by then, and each time before we left Germany, he would make us tell him what dates we wanted covered next time. Then he'd give us full details of what he would put on at the opera on those nights, and we would return to England ready brief. When we came back into Germany next time, we were just a couple of opera-mad English coming for a special performance. Of course we were sufficiently opera fans to play the role, and Krauss never let us down once. But under cover of his performances, we did our interviewing and investigating. We did quite a bit of smuggling, too, because if you could get out someone's jewellery in advance, they then would have something to live on when you got them out themselves. We had to be careful to go in by one frontier and out by another to lessen the risk of detection. And if we were smuggling out fur coats, for instance, we were always careful to stitch an English label in first. Tell me, did you get any help from people in England? Oh, yes. Once you could make them understand what was happening. Ah, but the difficulty was to make them understand. There was so little in the papers in those days, and people got frightened and angry when we tried to explain, said we were warmongers and trying to stir up hatred. Of course, in a way, one does understand why people's minds just rejected so much horror. After all, how could one believe that someone one remembered as a, a prosperous man in Hamburg or a faded aunt in Frankfurt or a not very likeable cousin in Munich was in daily fear of being murdered? It just didn't make sense. And then just when you thought you'd settle the case, it could be wrecked on a detail. Oh, yes. There was the case of a Polish boy who wrote to us from the prison camp of Spongin on the Polish border. After terrific efforts, we'd managed to get him an English guarantee and obtained all the right papers for him and found him a home in England where he could live until his American visa number came up. And then, when I went to the refugee committee with his papers, the girl who usually dealt with our cases said, Oh, my dear, we've just had an order in not to accept any case with a visa number higher than 16,000. And this boy's number was 16,500 and something. I said I simply couldn't write back and blast all his hopes now. She must think of something. And she, was a, she was a very resourceful girl, as a matter of fact. Suddenly she handed me back one of the papers and said, go home with this and I'll write you asking for the missing paper and dating my letter three days ago. The case will date from the first letter in the file and we'll get him in that way before the new rule came into force. And imagine, you know, that on details like that people's lives hung. In the end we hauled him out and the very week war broke out. And the last man to go on the last boat that left Poland, then the port of Gdynia was closed and the war began. You were very lucky with your refugee committee, weren't you? We were. The war, of course, brought your work to an end. Yes, I was evacuated to North Wales for the first two years, and we were part of it the first time in our lives. But of course, the war meant separation for everyone, and at least we were lucky enough to be reunited after those two years. And then, after the war, were you able to pick up your operatic interests again? Yes, we were amazingly fortunate. The first Christmas after the war, Ida wrote to most of the opera stars we'd known, and even to one we hadn't actually known personally, the great Rosa Poncel, the legendary figure of our operatic youth. And she actually wrote back in such terms that I decided, really I think this was one of my best ideas, I must say, 
that on the anniversary of her London debut, I would hold a party for the gallery enthusiasts of the old days and put through a transatlantic call to her in her home in Maryland. It was 13 years since any of us had seen or heard her, and almost the first thing she said to us was, would you like me to sing to you? And over the years and the miles, this is what we heard. sound as if it's very easy to visit opera stars on level <laughs> terms, to go to the opera whenever you feel like it and so on. It isn't. And I'd like to know why you think you were able to do it. We knew what we wanted and expected to earn it ourselves. Well, it isn't only that. We aren't interested in stars just because they are stars. We're interested in those we consider the finest exponents of our favourite art. And it's natural then to try to meet them personally. And as our parents had always taught us that life didn't owe us the things we wanted, we've used all the ingenuity and thought and experience we have to achieve our object. And nowadays, do you still keep up your operatic trips abroad? Oh, certainly. Uh, fortunately, Louise has six weeks leave a year, and we try to have three weeks in New York and two weeks in Europe. Very lucky. Sounds pretty expensive to me. Well, we've never changed our style of living. We don't keep a car. We neither of us have a fur coat. She might one day. <laughs> <laughs> and we spend all our money on foreign travel. And we like to think we've proved that life can be just as dramatic and exciting as our favourite opera, so long as you know what you want and go after it. Well, the Cook sisters are going back now, Ida to her typewriter and Louise after the lunch hour to her office. Ah, <laughs> 